Jason Walker joining us now from Shore, and he's going to be talking about all things wireless. Jason is a wireless specialist, having grown up Suntronics. Suntronics, yes. Suntronics, a company, a RF wireless specialist, and ended up specializing in high-end broadcast and yep. very visible productions that you have experienced. Jason was uh, in charge of making sure the microphones were happy and working there, and if he heard a drop out, it was his fault. Totally, 100%. Anyway, so let me turn it over to Jason, our new Nashville resident, uh, moved here from his native Las Vegas. And, yes. Uh, we're able, glad that we have him here as a resource to help you out today. Thanks for having me, Frank. A wonderful introduction. Jason Waffle here. Uh, we're going to talk for about an uh, hour and 30 minutes on wireless. Um, so uh, I, I like to do this uh, two ways. We can either do death by PowerPoint for the next hour and 30 minutes, or I show you some slides and talk about some things. Or if you guys have questions at any time at all, just uh, you know, fire them out. It's a pretty small group. Um, the beginning of this for about 30 minutes is some pretty um, in-depth theory um, in terms of modulation schemes, how wireless works, why it works, what the physics of it are. Um, and we do that, or I start off that way because at the end of it, you, uh, it really starts to tie into what you can do to help yourself out in terms of antenna placement um, and why uh, some of that stuff is working. So if you know some of the physics behind it, um, we start to see some light bulbs go off uh, towards the end of the pre presentation for it to actually make sense practically for you. Uh, cool? Yeah. All right. Cool. Let's dive in. Uh, that is my email and my full name. If you guys don't have it, you can come get a card from me at the table or you can take a picture of it right here. Uh, I am based in Nashville. I do market development for sure, as mentioned before. Um, and was with Soundtronics for about 10 years prior to this doing broadcast RF installations. So today we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to describe the operating principles of radio transmission. We're going to describe the attributes and advantages of digital versus analog. Uh, position our antennas for best results and how we do that. Perform a scan, identify interference. Um, basically coordination basics, if you will. Uh, and correctly design the system um, to get the, the most optimal placement of your cables and your antennas overall. So let's start with some fundamentals. This one's pretty simple. Uh, basically for RF, you need two things. You need something that's transmitting and something that's receiving. Right? So I've got a belt pack on the back of my body. You're all familiar with this. It's transmitting out of an antenna. And we're going to ship that over to some receive antennas that you see on the left side of this room. Um, so, in all RF applications, you need both those things, something transmitting, something receiving. If I was sending some PS1000 or some in-ear monitors um, out, you're going to have a transmit antenna to an in-ear monitor belt pack, and, and that <coughs> antenna then is transmitting from the fixed location, and the receiver is then on the body. I know this is basic, but just gauge in the room and see where we're at. So, the difference between a radio wave and an audio wave, if you're familiar with your audio wave properties, there's a lot of similarities. The biggest difference is that a radio wave is electromagnetic, and that means that it travels at the speed of light. So if you're used to calculating your sound wave calculations for your system tuning based on the calculations of the, the length of an audio wave, there's some similarities there, but the radio wave travels much faster. It can also travel through a vacuum. It does not need a medium. Uh, so the wavelength, obviously, is the length of one full cycle. Uh, you can compare this to audio if you'd like. The amplitude is how powerful that wavelength is or that wave is, and the frequency is how often is that thing cycling uh, per second. Uh, so this slide is going to have a whole lot of math on the top. Uh, you can feel free to take a picture of that equation if you'd like to do your own calculations. Um, if not, what we really like to focus on is right down here at the center. Most of you live in the UHF spectrum, uh, right around 600 or 500 megahertz or 400. You're in between most of that. So we talk about generally about a two-foot wavelength. If you were to run that equation at that megahertz, you come out to about two feet at 500 megs. So most of us are talking about a wavelength that's about yay big in size. Okay? Um, and that's really important when you start to talk about how you place antennas in your space. And if you can try to visualize the radio waves where you're at and where you're set up, why does two feet matter? And how does it affect um, what we're doing with our placement and our transmission quality? Uh, if any of you guys are running VHF antennas uh, or VHF systems, you'll notice those wavelengths are significantly higher. You're looking at almost 10 feet at 100 and 5 feet at 200 uh, megs. And then obviously we're familiar with those Wi-Fi antennas on those little routers that are super tiny squigglies that all coordinates to the wavelength size of what you're transmitting. 
So you see the VHF antennas that are huge, and then we've got our UHF antennas in the middle, and the Wi-Fi antennas, that coordinates to your wavelength, right? They're made for that way for a reason. Um, so this is important because we need to know how big our wavelength is, and then we need to know what could possibly interfere with that wavelength. Um, so if I had a giant steel wall between my body pack and my receiving antenna, that could be a problem, right? So you see the hand mic transmitting. There's some obstacle between my receiver and my wavelength property, and you're not going to have a healthy uh, transmission scheme at that point. This is where we talk about the term line of sight in RF, meaning that the best opportunity you can give yourself is to have a direct line of sight from your body pack or your hand mic to your antenna without anything in between or mitigating that line of, line of sight pathway. Um, uh, if the obstacle is smaller than the wave or significantly smaller than the wave, most radio waves can wrap right around it, right? So these mic stands and those microphones between me and those receive antennas are not necessarily causing an issue. They're going to move right through that because they're much skinner than two feet, right? Make sense? I like to relate this to a microwave, which everybody has at their house, or most people have at their house. Microwaves operate at 2.4 gigs. That happens to be the uh, frequency at which water molecules vibrate. And so we vibrate the molecules, you get friction, and our food heats up. Well, what is in the window of your microwave? There's this metal plate that has a bunch of little tiny holes in it. So light is on the spectrum as well in terms of radio waves. It's just way higher. So the radio or the wave at which light transmit is significantly smaller than a 2.4 gig wave. So they've put this metal gate in a, in a window, and the light waves pass through, as do all the visual aids to what you can see in your microwave. But the 2.4 waves are significantly larger than the holes in your grate in your microwave, and therefore you are not effective with radiation from your microwave when you use it. Does that make sense? Yeah? Cool. Um, so this is kind of the microwave thing. The hole uh, is larger or smaller depending on what your wave size is for something to go through. Those holes are much too small for a 2.4 wave to make it through, so they don't in a microwave aspect, but it works the same way in a real life application. Um, not going through. Um, so think about LED walls or set pieces or uh, <laughs> If you're doing RF at a baseball field and there's a chain link fence for some reason, we see this all the time, where somebody puts a mic for an anthem out on the field. Obviously, this is not House of Worship uh, specified, but the antennas are behind the chain link fence. That chain link fence opening is not two feet wide. You're going to have a bit of a, a problem with that, right? You can see through it, but the radio wave doesn't necessarily make its way through that chain link fence. Make sense? Awesome. So that's kind of our basics on RF propagation. Um, just to clarify, this is what I'm giving you today is our Sure Audio Institute wireless masterclass that I have taken down and sucked into this drinking from the fire hose hour and a half presentation. Um, so if you want, this slide deck is on our website. Um, like uh, Chris mentioned, uh, SureAudioInstitute.com. It's significantly longer with a bunch more information. So you can go to Sure Audio Institute uh, and get the slide deck. Uh, this is a condensed version, but you'll get all these slides and many more with uh, a bunch more principles included in them. So operating spectrum in local RF landscape. Uh, is anybody in this room not familiar with the FCC sell-off auction that is commencing or finalizing in July? Everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say we've sold 600 megahertz? Nobody's raising their hand saying no? You don't? You're unfamiliar-ish? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna cruise through it real quick, but essentially the FCC said, hey, we're going to make a bunch of money off air. We're going to sell a bunch of spectrum that we used to be able to use for RF microphones, uh, and now we can't. So to explain that a little bit, this is what we consider the radio spectrum in the United States, from 300 kilohertz down to 500 gigs, and that is how the FCC chops that up. This is available on our, our website and the FCC website as well. Uh, this will tell you every way possible the FCC has chopped up the RF spectrum on a regulation standpoint. What we care about is the UHF bands for the for the most part, right? When we talk about wireless mics, there are there are many microphone manufacturers that make stuff in different areas, 2.4, uh, some decked items. But what we look at here when we talk about the sell-off, anyways, is uh, in 2009 we had a sell-off up here of above 700 meg, um, and what we used to have was this 470 to about 698, which is right there, okay. Um, and that was what we had after the 2009 sell-off. And recently, about five years ago, the FCC said, hey, we're going to sell off this big chunk here right in the middle that just turned yellow. And we're going to sell that to anybody that wants to buy it. 
most of the purchasers were T-Mobile and Dish and some cell phone companies. Uh, but what happens when that takes place is you take this spectrum that's left, you almost reduced it to half, not quite, um, and we get a big frequency crunch in terms of the space or the landscape we have to operate wireless devices in the UHF spectrum. Um, so here's the purchases. This is uh, about the dollar value um, of what it was sold for. I always like to say if I could figure out how to sell air for billions of dollars, I would keep doing it. Uh, so that's what we're looking at or what we're faced with in, as far as an RF challenge and possibly why some of your mics may have stopped working at your church or your venue recently or will you, may be reasons for purchasing new ones. Um, so this is a, a little bit more of an infographic of what we're looking at for the final landscape. Um, and if you, we get into coordination of it later, this might be a little bit more pertinent. Um, but when we talk about um, TV channels, uh, in the United States, TV channels are broken up into six megahertz blocks. Um, and that's what these little white blocks here on the bottom are. So the first one is 470 to 476, if you can read it. Uh, and that's what we consider TV channel 14. Um, and this was mandated by the FCC. So originally, when you had bunny ears in the 1950s and you turned on channel 14, your bunny ears were tuning to 470 to 476. That's what was happening when you would turn that dial. This is how analog TV was created. Through the multiple repacks that had happened and the digital tr television transition change, uh, those, those numbers no longer cor correlate to what the television station is. So you could be watching TV channel 9, and it wouldn't actually coordinate to the frequencies that are TV 9. Why did that happen? So if you were a broadcast station that was on TV channel 38 through 51, uh, which would be these ones up here that got sold, you had two options. The FCC said you can move down below TV channel 38, or you can go off the air. So not only did the FCC sell this big chunk up here where it's yellow, if there was an operating TV channel in your city or your area, and they decided to stay on the air, they shifted their transmission portion down into this limited portion of landscape that we had left. Um, and if you know anything about DTV, if DTV is, exists on a channel, you're probably not operating a wireless mic on that channel. So when we talk about the wireless spectrum crunch, it's not just that they sold this spectrum, it's that operating DTV channels that were above that channel 37 have been repacked, you'll hear about the repack as well, where they shifted down to a, a channel that is available to them, uh, and therefore also congesting the space we have available to us. Okay. Um, so really, landscape uh, and real estate is super at a premium right now. Additionally, we've added recently this thing called public safety channels. So on the left, you'll see this list of public safety channels, and there's some cities listed there. This varies city to city. It's a city ordinance. The FCC has allowed TV channels 14 through 19 and a half to be used for public safety. This is your police department, your ambulances, your um, you know anti-terrorism units, depending on what city you're in. Um, and so you should be aware, if you're in any, one of those cities, that if you're in TV channels 14 through 19 and a half, that it's possible if an ambulance drives by your church, you're going to have an RF interference event. Okay, so what I really want you to take away from this is that it's important to know what your area is, what your DTV is, and what your safety channels are according to your GPS location. Okay, because there's a lot of stuff going on around you, and it's getting really hard or really tight to make that happen. So what we're left... Uh, Currently, for most operating bands in the U.S. for microphones and in-ears, um, is this graph right here. Um, so the broadcast and the consumer colors between blue and yellow have to do with the Part 74 license, uh, which is a topic we're not going to dive into today. It's mostly for high channel count broadcasters um, and larger installations, but it's a way to protect or to allow you to, to register with the FCC and operate in certain bands. Um, so this little blue silver up here at the top, this number 8, you actually can only operate in the 944 to 955 band if you have a Part 74 license. Why is that important? Uh, because there's going to be less people that have Part 74 license, which means the power users are going to elect to get those licenses, and that's going to be kind of like beachfront property for a lot of locations. Uh, Super Bowl Miami, every mic on the halftime show this last year at the Super Bowl was in 944+, plus because that was basically the only place you could operate in Miami, because Miami is bananas from an RF environment. So you're looking at this big blue chunk here in the middle. 
The reason it is categorized in broadcast is because there is going to be a there's supposed to be a channel limit on what you're allowed to propagate. It hasn't come to fruition yet, um, and if it does, it will be well popular. Uh, well, highly talked about. We're not quite there yet. I, I think it should be yellow. It's still a consumer bandwidth, and it, it should be for a while. But that's what we have left. There's DECT and Wi-Fi as well at the top. Uh, DECT is Digital Enhanced Cordless Technology. That's the 1.9 band if you're using any PLs. I don't know of any mics in that bandwidth or in-ears. That has to do with latency. Okay. Any questions on RF landscape? We're drinking from the firehouse this morning, I know. Uh, but you're really going to be looking at that UHF block from, anybody have VHF microphones in their venue or use VHF? No, most of it's like 470 to 600 is that we're working in? Okay, awesome. I just want to make sure I'm not leaving anybody out. So that's RF landscape and uh, kind of the basics of how RF works condensed down. Uh, module 3 and 4, we're going to talk about how we transmit with analog RF. And then after that, we're going to talk about how we transmit with digital RF, right? We've seen this big change in the industry between certain manufacturers that make analog or digital products. Why is that? What are the differences? What are the advantages and disadvantages? So just keep in mind, until we get to the next module, we're talking solely about an analog scheme, okay? <clears throat> so analog RF transmission. We're going to transmit audio uh, over a radio wave. Right? So what happens is you modulate, modulation enables an RF carrier to carry information. So you get a baseband signal, which in this case is my voice coming into this capsule. That's the baseband. Uh, and then you combine that and you modulate that signal and you end up with a carrier. That carrier is the frequency at which you transmit. Okay? So carrier signals, 470 mag in this example. Uh, we're going to modulate that. Uh, in this case, it's an FM, which means we're frequency modulated. We're going to talk about those in a minute. You add your baseband, which in this case is my voice, and you get this modulated radio signal at the bottom, and that flies through the air at the speed of light and then hits an antenna, and your receiver is going to convert that with the same language into intelligible audio coming out of your audio port. Okay? So how do we do this? Uh, there's three types of analog modulation. You've got amplitude, frequency, and phase modulation. Okay? So in, uh, we're going to talk about all three of those. So the first one is amplitude modulation, also known as AM or AM radio. Okay? Uh, so amplitude of the carrier of the wave is varied in proportion to the modulated or baseband signal. Um, this is limited to pro audio for a couple reasons. There's a lot of transmission loss, there's a limited bandwidth, and it's super susceptible to noise. Um, why? So, as I get further away from my receive antennas, there's physics and implementations of what's happening around me between this transmitter pack, that speaker now, <laughs> and uh, these antennas. Okay, and this happens in every space. Physics and in your environment are going to affect the radio wave as it goes through the room. Uh, so, in an amplitude modulation scheme, what happens is you start out with an amplitude modulation of of um, let's say a, a hundred, just to keep it easy, when it leaves my body pack. As that goes through the air, regardless of how line of sight it is, that peak point is going to diminish, just based on physics, right? So the information packets, uh, or the information itself, has degraded over time because the amplitude is what's conveying the information. So if you look, we're going to vary the amplitude um, on the bottom which is matching the wave input at the top, or the audio input at the top, right? So you see the amplitude get larger and smaller, and that's conveying what's happening in the baseband signal, and then we're demodulating that information on the back end. The problem with this is what I just said, that over time, this wave is doing this in amplitude, just based on distance, right? So you're not getting the, the full value of information from where it left the transmitter at the receiver. Make sense? This is why AM radios get distorted much more than FM radios over distance. Cool? So that's AM. Phase modulation. Uh, this is, to my knowledge, not used in any uh, wireless audio uh, device. Uh, phase modulation is where you vary the phase of the wave. Uh, the reason this is not used in an analog wireless device, I should correct myself, uh, is because there's only two data points, in phase and out of phase. So it's very limited on what you can convey from an information standpoint. 
Um, there are some very simple RF devices that use phase modulation that only need basically two data points of information, yes or no, on or off. Um, if you're familiar with how anything in digital works, there's a lot of binary code going on, we're going to talk about that later, but you can get a one and a zero out of this pretty effectively, just to lead into what's next. So that brings us to FM or frequency modulation. This is your FM radio, and this is what's used in most um, analog radio radio wave audio systems. Um, so it's used in synthesizers, computer sound cards, uh, our sure analog wireless systems, and multiple other vendors as well. Um, so how does frequency modulation work? Um, we talked about amplitude modulation. We're going to change the amplitude. In frequency modulation, we're going to take our center carrier, let's say 470 megahertz in this example, and we're going to modulate that carrier ever so slightly. Um, and this is regulated by the FCC of how wide we can get our modulation scheme. Right? They want our carrier to be somewhat narrow. And in those modulations, plus or minus a couple, a couple cents, if you will, uh, we're going to be able to send information or deviate information. So you're going to see the baseband signal at the top changing, and you're going to see two important factors here. The first one is that the amplitude is staying the same. We're not changing the amplitude at all. So what that means is over distance, if that amplitude degrades, like we talked about earlier, my receiver doesn't care. It's not looking for amplitude for information. It's looking for the frequency changes in information. Okay? This is why we think of FM as sounding a little bit more uh, quality versus an AM radio and why we use it for analog RF devices. Make sense? So this is uh, called deviation. So when you modulate your FM carrier, you get what's called deviation. And the deviation is how you measure how much the center frequency has deviated from that center frequency. And that's the measurement we talk about. Uh, and most manufacturers have their own deviation or modulation scheme to convey information. So the left is a unmodulated FM signal. Uh, and the right is if someone was screaming into that microphone and widening that deviation as wide as it could go to convey that, that vocal information. Okay? So uh, I put this in here at this point because it's really interesting to talk about uh, currently or, or at this point in the slide, but does anybody know or not know what multipath interference is? Great. This is probably one of the most important um, things to know about wireless. So uh, when this wave comes out of my whip antenna back here on this body pack, it's going to transmit out of it. And the best case scenario is that the wave is going to come straight out of this little antenna and go straight to that receive antenna, and I'm going to get that information right away. In reality, this radio wave comes out in pretty much all directions at an infinite amount of times. And that means that it's bouncing off the floor and that chair and your face and the ceiling and that screen and that speaker cabinet. And all those waves are then meeting at the antenna at different points in time. Okay? What else happens is that those waves meet at a different point in time and a different point in spatial in uh, relativity to the wave point. So we all know what happens when you have phase cancellation in an audio system. We can do it constructively or deconstructively. What happens when the radio wave that comes directly from my pack to that antenna hits at the same time that the reflection from the ceiling hits the antenna and they are directly out of phase at the wave point. You get a zero and you get a dropout. So that is what is called multipath interference. Multipaths combining at the same point out of phase causes a dropout. This is why the diversity system was invented and why we have an A antenna and a B antenna. So if the A antenna experiences a multipath interference event, we'll listen to the B antenna and that will allow us to avoid having a dropout because likely we're not having at the same point in time a perfectly out of phase event happening on the B antenna. Okay, so we talked about wavelength, we talked about how long a wave is, and doing the math and figuring that out, one could imagine that it would be important to have your two antennas, A and B, at a point where they're receiving separate signals that would not have the same multipath interference event when setting up a system. Does this make sense? So 500 meg is two feet wide. You probably want your antennas more than two feet apart, both your receive antennas, to avoid having the same multipath interference event at both those antennas at the same time. We're going to dive into that a little bit later, but I'd like to touch that point here. 
So that's multipath. Um, that video should work, but it's not. That's right, I think you get it. Um, so signal processing in an analog scheme. So what do we do with the signal and how do we process that based on multipath interference as well as from an audio standpoint? Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is talk about noise. So regardless of the amplitude degradation we talked about in the AM signals, the FM signal is still gonna experience some noise from multipath, uh, from hitting objects, from uh, OEOM, which is other electronics on stage, OEOS. So uh, this projector, those lights, those lights, my cell phone, the electricity running through these cables, all of that raises a bit of a noise floor in this room from an RF standpoint that none of us can see but exists. So when this wave goes through the air, it's going to be ex affected by all of this RF noise that exists in this room um, without you being able to see it. So what you get is this is what leaves the transmitter, <laughs> This is what receive gets to the transfer. You're going to have a little bit of jitter and a little bit of noise in that signal just based on physics. So we do a couple things. Uh, the first thing we do is a noise reduction or an emphasis EQ. Uh, the second thing we do is a dynamic range improvement, and then we do a, a couple things depending on analog and digital to process those. So the emphasis curve, we're doing a, a little bit of a boost on the high and high mids, and we're leaving the lows flat. And this is just based on what happens when you transmit through the air and that noise affects your wave. You lose some of the high to high mids from the audio standpoint. So in most um, high tier analog wireless systems, we have an emphasis curve. Once it hits the receiver, we do a de-emphasis. Um, this is called, it, it, the sauce varies. And this is where you hear a difference between uh, wireless systems and the audio quality. But that's one thing we're doing. The next thing is called companding. This is compression and expanding, put into one word, and you get companding. So dynamic range of a transmitter, for this instance, we're going to say is 100 dB. We'll do a one-to-one -one compression rate of that. We'll transmit that over on RF signal. Once it hits the receiver, we're going to one-to-one -one expand that, and you get back to your dynamic range. This is a limitation of, of the quality or the cost of the transmitter and the chipset inside wireless devices. So we have to reduce that dynamic range to allow to send this much information. Most of this comes down to, we talked about the deviation of, an, of a signal and how the FCC regulates the width at which we can deviate. That width puts a limitation on how much information we can send, right? Because there's only so much space that you can deviate and you only have so many data points within that of which you can, you can send information. Um, so to get really high quality audio, we have to do some compression to send that over this limited amount of space. And then we can de expand that or decompress it on the backside to get that information. Okay? So, multipath interference requires a diversity system. We've got an A and a B antenna, right? So now what do we do with that when we get to the receiver? Um, so there's a couple ways that we can process the RF wave portion of this. We can passively combine the A and the B RF input and ship that straight to the receiver. Okay, that's a pretty basic and super simple way of doing this. We can put a predictive switch in there. So that switch is going to look at one side of the RF, and basically uh, f with a certain algorithm or scheme, we're going to say, hey, the signal to noise is getting too high over here, or we're losing value over here. Let's look at B and see what it's doing and make a switch. In this example, this is a blind switch. Your device doesn't know what's on the B side. Um, you know, from, from a sure standpoint, not trying to dive into the products, but ULXD, if you guys use that, that is a predictive switching device. This is why you have one signal um, meter and then one blue light, and you'll see it switch back and forth if you're familiar with that. Receiver switching diversity. So this takes both inputs, and then you get an audio switch. So it's selecting which audio is best between the two sides. And then what is probably the best is you get two independent RF inputs and you actually combine those two audio signals together, creating the best of both. Any questions on analog transmission and analog signal flow and analog components? A lot, yeah. If you are seeing your antennas switch rapidly, mm -hmm. Uh, there's it, it two. It doesn't like stay on the antenna for a while. Like if you've got a lot of, it's just back and forth. As long as you can prove that you have a good signal 
in both antennas, that's actually the healthiest scenario on a switching system. Um, basically, if your antenna is stuck to A and it never goes to B, probably means that you have a, a system where the A sign has much less loss. So a 10-foot cable and an amplified antenna at plus 12 dB, right? And I've got 15 dB of gain on my left side or my A side. And your B side's got 100 feet of cable, and it's at neg 6 on the amp. And now you've got this giant variation between your A and your B side. So now your receiver thinks that the A has a better input and is seeing more gain from it and is stuck to that side, okay? And then if that has a multipath event, the right side might be so low in terms of how you have it set up, it's not even going to look to look there. So in, in most switch systems, you actually want to see a healthy bounce between the two because that usually means that your gain stage from your RF standpoint between your both sides are about the same. Um, we get into that a little bit later in terms of how to, what, what antennas have what properties. Um, but that's kind of the second really big point. Understand multipath and then designing your system. You want your A and your B side to be as close to a zero sum as they can be, um, unless you're doing some more advanced technique on, on implementing. But a, a constant switch, um, assuming that you have good RF level the whole time, I think you're pretty healthy. Yeah, that's, that's a good thing. That means your system's in balance. Cool? Anything else? Yeah? The scenario you were talking about with the audio where one switches back and forth and one combines, yep. is that two different levels of products that, that are available? Yeah, all five of those ex explanations of how we do our process combining, that, that slide set was, was basically designed to show you what the difference is between you know, an entry-level RF product is, regardless of manufacturer. Like, I know our products really well. I can tell you which ones were which. I know that most other manufacturers use the same type of combining and signal processing, and those are what elevates your cost um, through the price points. Um, so, yeah, th it was designed to kind of show you how, how, the, how it's working and why the cost is where it is. The other part is, like, the, switch, the, the switching unit that, that only requires one radio per channel inside your space. So if you have a quad unit that's a switch unit, you only have four radios. If you have a quad unit that's a dedicated unit, that's you're, you have eight radios, two per channel, right? So you add four more radios in there. So that's where the, it's designed to show you the scale positions of, of cost and, and what you're paying for. Anything else? How many have how many people have analog RF solely at their house? House of worship, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Anybody have digital RF? Yeah. So we're going to talk about digital. Uh, so digital modulation methods uh, are pretty much the same of amplitude, frequency, and phase. But on the right side, you'll see we call them ASK, FISC, and PISC. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying, and phase shift keying uh, are the terms we use when we talk about digital. Um, shift key refers to the discrete values of a binary signal, so a 1 or a 0 if you're familiar with binary and how we talk in a digital language. So. Digital baseband signal and your modulated carrier signal, this is an amplitude shift key, right? So one is a little amplitude, a zero is a big amplitude, and we do that, and that's how we change. Same problem here. Amplitude over distance is going to degrade. However, as long as you can tell enough difference between what is the small amplitude and the large amplitude, you can decipher a zero or a one. It's where you get into that middle ground between the two that you can't decipher it was a one or a zero, right? Frequency shift keying, so this is going to be a little modulation or a lot of modulation, and you get a 1 or a 0. Or what we use in most digital um, products is the phase shift key. Uh, so this doesn't change the modulation or the frequency. It just changes whether it's in phase or out of phase. And that's how you get your 1 and your 0. Um, the next question is, how do I get enough data off of two data points? Right? We talked about why that didn't work in an analog scheme. So let's take a look at that. First, we're going to talk about uh, noise and what it does with digital. So we, in the amplitude scheme, we talked about how the degradation of that noise will cause some problems. Right? We talked about in the middle point right there between the, the max and the minimum, there's a little shade of gray where you can't decide if it's a 1 or a 0. Um, at this point, you're still going to have a little bit of noise in your, from your physical space, right? the other electronics. However, in the digital world, you've got your clean carrier that comes straight out of my mic. You've converted that to ones and zeros. You're pushing that through, a, this looks like phase swap, right? You see the wave come in phase and out of phase. That's going to go through the air, and it's still going to be affected 
by noise, the same way that your analog carrier is. Although, once it comes to the receiver, the receiver's converting that back to ones and zeros. It's stripping the noise, doesn't care about it. It could determine whether it's a one or a zero or not. Whereas in the analog world, when it processes that, it's processed the actual analog wave, which has all the noise properties combined into it. So if you start, actually there's a slide in a little while, we'll get to that. So, two FSK, we talked about uh, two frequency shift keying. So uh, frequency shift key, this is your super entry level digital product. There's two data points, that's an on or an off, uh, and that's your two FSK. Eight phase shift key, which we're gonna talk about here, is what that looks like on a spectrum manager. And that's how we get a little bit more data. So how are we getting an eight phase shift key versus a two frequency phase shift key? So we do what's called symbol coding. Um, so two FSK gives you one bit of information. A four phase shift key gives you two bits of information. Eight PSK, three bits. And then all the way at the top is this thing called 16 QAM, uh, which is what's used in super top tier wireless devices right now, which is uh, quadrant amplitude modulation. We'll get into that to a bit. Um, but more bits per symbol, less required bandwidth. So this is gonna come back to that FCC regulation where if you wanted more bits, you could do that, but your bandwidth would have to get huge to send a bunch of those, and your carrier would have to be super wide. Uh, so to get more bits inside of what the FCC regulates your carrier width can be, we do what's called symbol coding. So uh, this is what this looks like. Now, this is a phase plot that we flattened out onto a piece of paper. So this is a 360-degree sphere that's flattened onto a piece of paper. On the right side, you see zero degrees out of phase is our one, and on the Left side, you see 180 degrees out of phase, which is our zero. So if it's in phase, it's a one. If it's out of phase, it's a zero. There's a two PSK, right? Two data points. Four PSK. If I'm in phase, one, one, I get two data points here. If I'm 90 degrees out of phase, I'm zero, one. If I'm 100 degrees out, I'm zero, zero. If I'm 270 out, I'm one, zero. Does this make sense? Now I get two bit depths. Eight PSK. Now I'm getting three bit depths. I get a 111, a 110, a 010, a 011. More information, same time, same bandwidth. Making sense? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, how do I get more than eight? Uh, so, this is 16 quam. So, you've got your four quadrants, right, on the plot diagram. Now we're talking about whether I'm in phase, at what point I'm in phase, and how much amplitude have I supplied to that data point that's 90 degrees out of phase. Right? So 25, 50, 70, you have 100% of amplitude at a certain point in the phase plot is a different piece of information. And now I got a whole lot of data information in the same bandwidth in the same data plot. Make sense? Sweet. So true digital diversity. Most digital manufacturers have this. Uh, this is a benefit of digital. And we talked about the multipath issue where you've got an A and a B antenna, and if you get a multipath interference on this side, you've degraded that signal strength, and it's got to switch to A, right, or switch to B, whichever had the problem. Um, the other benefit to digital, other than that we can get a bunch of information super linearly, is that we can do sum and error correction and data packet loss makeup. Um, so I can look at this plot and say, hey, out of these 16 data points, I've got 15 of them that are that are 95% where they're supposed to be. That's a really good packet, right? If, if the B side of the antenna only had one data point out of those 16 <laughs> that was in the right spot based on a certain algorithm, that's not a good packet of information. That means I had a multipath issue, or there was some noise, or that antenna didn't have a good signal point at that point. So I'm gonna take that one packet that's really good from over here, and I'm gonna combine it to the 15 packets that are really good over here, and if we're really lucky, it's going to be the one packet I'm missing on the B side, but not always, right? And we do that in real time. What the downside to this is, is in digital, one of the biggest drawbacks is latency. So that takes a little bit of time to do all that processing. So in top tier systems, we're looking at 1.9 milliseconds. Some of the middle grade systems, we're looking at 4 to 5 milliseconds. Some of the, the real entry level stuff can be 10, 15, 20, even 30 milliseconds of delay for them to do processing on whatever their secret sauce is from a manufacturer's standpoint. Uh, you can get those specs from whatever product you're looking at to purchase uh, or whatever you have currently. Uh, but what can be done with digital is you can take those packets, 
look at them from A and B, say which one has the best information, and then combine them to get a sum <coughs> out one side. We'll skip that. So, uh, when we talk about an analog system, we talk about what's called signal to noise ratio, and that's SNR. Um, this is kind of another really big point. I want to, I want to, if there's only a few things that you take away from it, this is one of them. Um, if you have an analog system, the most important thing for quality audio, or one of the most important things, is your SNR, or your signal to noise ratio. So what that means is, what is my signal strength from my microphone, and how far above the noise floor is that signal? Okay, so if uh, a really good noise floor in the RF world, if you've got a scanner, is like negative 100 dB. So most <laughs> mic transmitters at 20 milliwatts will put out about neg 30 dB, right? So I'm looking at 60 dB of separation. That's, you're never going to have any problems with that. Uh, if you're trying to operate a mic on top of a DTV channel that's at neg 40 dB, and you're at neg 30 dB, now I've only got 10 dB of separation. And between multipath and fade, there's often 8 to 10 dB of loss, and now you're going to get a dropout. So signal to noise is huge. You want as much space between your carrier signal and the noise as possible. That's in an analog system. The digital system we call it carrier to noise. Um, and the reason we call it carrier to noise is because we don't care as much about the signal over the noise. We care about whether the carrier can be, can be decoded above that noise. Okay, So you can be significantly closer to a noise floor with a digital system so long as the ones and zeros can be interpreted. We saw a slide a few slides back that showed why noise doesn't affect the digital system the way it does in analog, and this is where that comes into play. Questions on signal to noise and carrier to noise? Yeah? Is the fixed So, great question. Fantastic question. So, the amplitude portion of a QAM or an amplitude modulated digital scheme can be affected by unshielded audio uh, sources. Uh, so you've probably heard about this, uh, a backline guitar that has some pickups that are not properly shielded, and I use that term from a scientific standpoint, not a pitch standpoint. Uh, if you plug that into a, a digital microphone that's got an amplitude modulation scheme component to it, you're going to get what's known as like a digital hash. Um, and so that's the amplitude modulation moving so fastly and the unshielded audio properties getting into that and you get what almost sounds like white noise. Um, so there, there are a lot of ways to alleviate that and there's some ways that it, it, people just don't use them on certain, certain guitars and certain elements. Um, so yes, the amplitude modulation scheme can allow some noise from unshielded audio artifacts to get into that transmission scheme uh, and you get an unwanted noise. The ways to get rid of that are properly shield your audio inputs. Um, so use cables and pickups that are properly shielded. Uh, or you can do some, some funky things with your transmitters where you drop, you put the mic pad in and you drop them down to low power. So the output power of the RF is in like 2 milliwatts, for example. Um, and you put the mic pad in to NAG12 and you get that noise below what is the actual audible noise floor in the audio side of things. You transmit that, and then you're going to gain that back up a little bit without that noise. Um, so there's some tricks to get around it. Um, most, most audio manufacturers, from a microphone standpoint, um, have picked up on this a few years back and have, have put the proper shielding implementations into their devices. Vintage audio gear is going to be a large problem because it was not shielded properly when it was made. And nobody's going nobody's gonna to take your 1952 Gretsch and put some new pickups in it because your digital mic doesn't work with it. That's not going to happen. Uh, so, yes, the two downsides to digital are if you have an unshielded audio input, there's a little bit of a noise problem, um, and latency. The latency really only matters if you've got uh, a frontline act or BGVs that wear in-ears that are hyper aware of their input sound to their head. Uh, if they've got bone conduction, which some people do and some people don't from their own vocal, they'll hear, some people hear 5 milliseconds. It's unbelievable. Some people don't hear 50 milliseconds. You know? So when you look at your chain, talk about a digital mic to a digital console with some plugins and outboard to Pro Tools and ship it back in, like, you've got to look at your full audio chain of what your latency is and determine 
uh, if you've got a vocalist that has a problem with that. We don't see it much in spoken word, uh, but a lot of vocalists have, a, have an issue with the latency problem in the digital domain. Does that answer your question? Anything else? For now. What time is it? 11.25. Sweet. <laughs> We're doing pretty good. Um, okay, so signal to noise in the analog system is the most important. When we talk about carrier noise, um, it's not as important. So this is what that looks like on a chart. So in the analog world on the right, essentially as soon as the, the transmitter transmits from the pack or the hand mic or whatever transmitter it is, it's at what would be considered full value or 100%. And as we go through the space or the radio wave travels through the space, you get what looks like this. It's a degradation curve, right? Where the physics of the world and the other electronics and the distance is going to just gradually affect the quality of that audio. And it's this curve, you know, none of this is super scientific from a CNR standpoint, it's just a graphical representation. And then you get to a point where that signal can't, can't be um, interpreted anymore and you get a dropout. Whether that's a multipath effect or too much range or it goes below what would be um, the noise floor value and you get noise above. Similar to when you leave a city and your radio station starts to go static, 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 and then you get the next one. Or it just goes away, right? That is analog FM radio depreciating over distance. You can hear those artifacts, and either it's taken over by another station or taken over by the noise floor, and you get static, okay? Digital RF has what's called the digital shelf. So in digital RF, you can be really close to the noise floor. You can get really far away. All of those things don't affect your ones and zeros. You get the same quality of audio as you would over distance, over time, over space, right up until you don't. And then the same thing happens, and you're gone. It's gone entirely. Um, so there are some benefits and some drawbacks. Uh, you know, the drawback on the digital side is that you're not really sure that it's coming, pun intended. Um, uh, it just goes away really fast. Uh, if you're really good and you've been doing this long enough and you use an analog system, most guys can start to hear when that's about to take place and hear the artifacts of, of that might get too far away even if you're not looking at the representation meters, right? Um, the benefit to the digital thing is, is that you don't hear any artifacts right up until you do. And most manufacturers put in um, a mute switch that happens uh, prior to what would be the noise effect of that noise coming in. So if you know what squelch is, anybody use squelch? Okay, so on an analog system, squelch is what the meter at which you allow basically your gate to pass audio on your RF system. Um, and so if you were to set your squelch on this analog system on the right, uh, just above that red line, essentially your audio gate would close and you wouldn't hear that hash when your analog system got to that fail point, right? In most digital systems, we have what's called a digital squelch, we call it a digital mute. It's reading that based on the packet information. It knows before you do that it's not going to have good information. It puts a mute on it, and you don't hear a click, a pop, or a static. Cool? It's just gone. <coughs> so, next uh, benefit to analog versus digital. Uh, I'm going to preface this with saying that this is a generalization of the majority of analog systems and the majority of digital systems and how they're built, what manufacturers are putting in. So in an analog system or most analog RF systems, the requirements of the amplifiers in those systems uh, were not required to be hyperlinear. They could do a good enough job and get the signal across with um, basically a, a cheaper or lesser cost amplifier. Um, in a digital scheme, because of how the modulation scheme is uh, transmitted, it requires a hyperlinear amplifier, meaning that it's, it's almost a square wave in terms of what is being amplified and what is not. So the effects of that are what's called intermods. Is anybody aware of intermods? All right, musicians in the room? Understand music much? A little bit? Okay, so you play a middle C on a piano, you're hearing, additionally, the third and the fifth above and below that, and the seventh and the ninth at a certain level, right? That is an audio wave that creates thirds and fifths and sevenths and ninths above what the middle tone is. In music, you play those together, it's a harmonious thing, you get a chord. In RF, you combine some thirds and some fifths with your, your carrier and you get destructive events, okay? So, a lot of similar properties. You got radio waves, you put 20 of them in a room, 
Uh, there's a chart a little bit later that explains to you how many intermods are created on average from analog systems, but you're not just transmitting at that center frequency, you're transmitting at thirds and fifths equally out, and ninths and sevenths, and thir three by threes. Um, and so is the next mic you have on, and so is the next mic you have on. And all three of those can combine to create a third or a fifth that's more powerful than your sixth mic in your chain. This is where frequency coordination comes into play as well. So what we're going to look at here on the right is nine analog transmitters through a spectrum analyzer that are six feet apart. So six feet apart on a table, so you know, you've got nine, this whole room would have a bunch of transmitters six feet apart on it. Same thing on the right, but those are digital transmitters. When I put those analog transmitters eight inches apart, this is what your noise floor does. Those intermods have all combined, right? And they've created this disastrous noise floor of which you have to work in. The linearity amplifiers of digital systems, most of them do not create those intermod schemes. And if they do, they're well below the noise floor. So uh, this is a sure specific chart, but there are other manufacturers that make this, this option. This is called high density mode. So uh, you'll notice that you've got very linear squares of transmit carriers. Um, there's 200 kilohertz of spacing there for your standard, which is the yellow graph. That's how much space we're allowed to take up. The FCC gives us 200 kilohertz. We took all of it. Uh, in HD mode, which is a setting you can use uh, with one of our products, uh, you can get that down to 125 kilohertz mode. Why does this matter? So um, if you look back to here, this is nine transmitters within, uh, what's the scale on this? 1.8 megs, 18 megahertz, yeah, so two TV channels, well, three TV channels. Is that 16 or 18? Uh, so earlier we talked about the loss of space, right? How much real estate did we lose? The DTV channels moved down. We only have this much spectrum that we can use, and that's dwindling and going away quite rapidly. So that was one of the big reasons why we moved to digital, because if that's three TV channels on the right, first, you're going to be really lucky if you could find three TV channels that are wide open in your area. That's not usually a thing. Usually there's a DTV and then an open and then a DTV and an open. So now you've affected a ton of your space with your transmitters. And on this side, you have not. You've combined a bunch of transmitters into a little space. They're efficient. They're not affecting each other from an RF standpoint. And they're working well. In HD mode, in our product and in others, you're looking at trying to remember the specs on, on other manufacturers. It's like 28 to 44 microphones in one TV channel, which if you had analog microphones is impossible, unheard of, never going to happen. You're looking at like 12 mics in one TV channel max with a really linear analog system. Okay? So most, this is the trend. You're, one of the reasons why you're seeing manufacturers go to digital is for spectral efficiency. Okay? Not so much in your world, but uh, top tier touring and broadcast, we see a lot of encryption requests. You can't encrypt an analog carrier, you can't encrypt a digital carrier, put a little key in there, make it so somebody can't pull your artist's audio off and put it on YouTube and you know, cause a scene, save your job. But maybe not relevant to you. So advantages of digital RF. Simultaneous systems, high density mode, wider, flatter frequency response, dynamic range, signal to noise ratio, artifacts, etc. Any questions on analog or digital, how they work, what the benefits are, what the drawbacks are, spectral efficiency, I know that's a whole lot. Yeah. More of a comment. Um, yeah. If you especially have analog uh, mics, you know, if you ever have any stage or mics, there's the tinfoil tray. Oh, yeah, the trays. Is everybody familiar with what he's talking about? Has anybody seen this? Yeah. Um, yeah, so high channel count, analog RF right. mics, you've got an A2, or you've got your, your, your pile of mics that you're going to put on a show. You turn them all on, you set them on a table. We saw what happened to the noise floor, right? It goes through the roof. So um, a few years back, a couple RF engineers figured out that you could use <laughs> baking bread trays, which are these aluminum bread trays that you break bread in. Label them, stick them on the table, drop your mic inside that. What we know about metal and deflection, you've created this little Faraday cage for this mic to live in. You've reduced your intermods. 
now the mic that's out, the one mic that's out, isn't being affected by the 12 mics that are powered up on a table with the antennas all sitting right next to each other, creating all these terrible properties. Cool? Get some bread trays. <laughs> yeah. Not quite. The, 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 uh, it's not aluminum, because aluminum will go ahead and uh, the current will induce a, uh, a voltage into it, which will then create a frequency seven tenths of a percent less than the output. What you're using is carbon steel trays. That's what you're using. The steel will create the shape, the shielding that you're desiring. Steel trays, excuse me. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so we're gonna talk about antennas. We make a bunch, so do a bunch of people. Um, so there's a bunch of different types, shades, shapes. <laughs> Shapes, sizes. Uh, so we talked about earlier the antenna size is proportional to wavelength. So you can have a giant antenna for UHF, middle grade. Wi-Fi antennas are super small. Um, we have different pickup patterns. So we had the, the hardwire mic discussion a little bit earlier, talking about pickup patterns. Uh, we can plot those out, and we'll see those in a minute, very similar to a mic pattern. Wideband and narrowband. Uh, so those are two terms that we throw around um, and assume you know what that means. Uh, but if you don't, narrow band is going to be an antenna that's tuned to a smaller bandwidth portion. So the little whip antennas that you get with some of your manufacturer's products are probably tuned to three to six TV channels width and designed for that one rack unit that you purchased. So if you've got an A band or a B band piece of Sennheiser or a G or a J Sure or a, uh, you know, Electro Block 21, all those little antennas that they ship are tuned for that block segment, right? They're not a wide band, they're a narrow band. So you shouldn't use those narrow band antennas on different products unless they're the same bandwidth, okay? Wide band antennas are what we see in antenna distro units like the ones over here, and those are designed to be much wider. Most of them are the UHF spectrum 470 to 698, although we do make the VHF ones as well. And then you can talk about the X band, the 902 to 928, or the 944 to 950 plus stuff getting some Yagi antenna design. So, we also have forward gain, uh, which is passive, and then active amplification. Um, so all options in your antenna uh, design basics. So, uh, there's that graphic, that giant antenna we were talking about, the VHF boy, and then the UHF. Um, so what's really happening in these antennas is you've got, it's called a LPDA, um, is the scientific name, people call it a shark fin. LPDA stands for Log Periodic Directional Antenna. Um, and what that means is there's this center pin right here that's conducting most of the electromagnetic energy. And if you've ever been up close to one of these, you're going to see these little strips that come down and then up and then down and then up and then down and then up, right? Um, those, those strips are tuned to different frequency ranges or long, and that's how you get wideband, right? So the shorter wavelength and the smaller wavelength is going to be at the front, and the lower wavelength and the lower frequency is going to be at the back, and those all meet that center pin and then come down and hit your cable. Okay, so log periodic directional antenna. Pickup patterns. Um, so we've got a couple different pickup patterns for most antenna design. Uh, this is an omnidirectional graph chart. So this is the dipoles that we ship you uh, that are usually narrow bands or the large external dipoles you can buy. Uh, people like to call this omnidirectional. It's not really, it's more toroidal if you're using the proper terms. That means that the top and the bottom um, are a little bit negligent, as you can see on those graphs. A lot of people like to put these dipoles over <laughs> their speaker directly above their head, and they've actually created this neg field directly above them. Uh, you could turn it sideways, but we can talk about polarization a bit later as well. Uh, so here's your directional uh, LPA fin. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that the, how this is working is that if you get a, um, a frequency that's at 470, right, and that's, that's going to be a pretty small wave, and that's going to hit that little tiny strip at the front of that antenna, right? Uh, it's also going to hit the next strip, and the next strip, and the next strip, and they're separated by, you know, a couple centimeters. As it hits every strip, it's going to do what's called passive amplification. So it's going to get that signal, and then get it again, and then get it again, and then get it again, right? Um, so the reason this is directional is not because it doesn't see RF from the back or because there's some shield. It's directional because the RF coming from the front of it is passively amplified, and the RF coming from the back of it is not. 
So that doesn't mean that I can stand right behind this antenna with a microphone and it's not going to pick it up. That's not the case. It's not as directional as a microphone. You're just talking about what dB increments of signal do you get, and, and we're measuring that based on this, this plot. Okay? Cool. Half cordioid, we see this in some uh, 2.4 implementations. Not relevant to you guys. Helical. So this is a helical antenna. There's a bunch of versions of them. This is a wound copper cable um, that picks up wideband frequencies. The difference between this is that, as you can see, it's what we call circularly polarized. Um, so if I have a hand mic in my hand, and that antenna is vertically polarized in the space, the wave coming off of that antenna is going to be vertically polarized. If I turn that hand mic and hold it horizontally, that wave is going to be horizontally polarized. In a perfect world, we want our antennas to try to be on the same axis and picking up the wave in the same polarization space um, as the transmitter. So we see this in a lot of applications for in-ears or IFB transmits, um, basically because as that comes out of that, it's going to be spinning. The polarization is going to be changing throughout time, as are the reflections. Uh, and you actually have a better, better chance of catching somebody on their, their belt pack as they move around, of being at whatever less off axis than you would be. Um, so that's the advantage to a circularly polarized antenna. Whereas this belt pack is pretty much fixed vertically on my back, and as is that LPDA. So chances are that those two vertical polarized antennas are going to pair up a little bit nicer. Make sense? Uh, narrow band and wide band, forward gain. So forward gain is a, a passive uh, gain structure. We talked about how that's achieved. As, as frequencies hit multiple points in the antenna, they are passively amplified. Um, there's some numbers that have been taken at center frequencies, which is usually 500 um, in manufacturers at what their forward gain is. Why is forward gain important and why do you need to know? Um, the question earlier brought up uh, balance between left and right sides or A and B sides, right? So if you've got a 14 dB passively gained antenna on your A side and you've got your 2 dB passive gained manufacturer width on your B side, you've got quite a separation of signal strength between your A and your B. Doesn't mean it's not going to work, it just means you've created a separation, right? So uh, this whole segment at the end of this is is designed to tell you what the items in your inventory are doing and why, and then for you to go make a decision on how to implement that best in your space. There's not really black and white answers in RF. Every room is going to be different. Every rack is going to be different, right? Every piece of cable you have has a different loss measurement to it. Um, so really just trying to get you some basic principles for you to go make an, an educated decision on what you want to do when you get back uh, to your venue. Um, directional antennas are, are pretty amazing though, like there's been gigs where I have, I'm trying to think of one really good example, uh, I was in LA on like the 50th floor of a sky rise and there was the building next to me had an antenna off the top of it that was obviously transmitting something fairly heavily and when I initially set up I had my antennas pointing out the window and my noise floor was through the roof. So I ran 150 feet of cable to the back side of the room, turned those antennas around, faced them towards me and the venue and my noise went down like 30 dB um, just from turning those antennas around. So use your antenna placement, uh, pretend it's a flashlight beam, what are you, what are you picking up? You know, you stand behind it and, and look down at, you know, like a scope um, and find out what you're picking up and why and what could be a possible f interference in that pathway and where can you move your antenna to alleviate that. Active antennas. These are antennas with um, amplifiers built into them uh, you can get amplifiers that exist that go in line in your cable that you can externally power supply uh, or you can power with what's called bias. Um, bias is just the term for the voltage that we ship down the BNC cable uh, to power these amplifiers. It's uh, industry standard. Uh, most mid to high level receivers, mic receivers will have bias as will most mid to high level distribution amplifiers. Uh, some of them are even selectable. You can turn them on or off. So it's, bias just refers to the power that is going down the same cable to power the amplifier. So you don't have to plug an external power supply in. Um, active antennas were designed pretty much for one purpose, um, and that is to compensate for cable loss. Um, so basically, if you were doing an install or a, a shoot, or you've got um, a situation where you have a long distance between your RF rack and where your antennas need to be, um, you start to get loss over cable length. 
right? And there's, I think I took it out of this uh, deck because we don't have time for it, but at 150 feet, at like an RG58 or an MR400, you're looking at uh, around 3 dB of loss for 150 feet of cable, and that's kind of an estimate. Um, so lower quality cable, um, you can get up to 10 dB, uh, 15 dB on 40 or 50 feet. just depends on what cable you have. Um, so understanding what your cable loss is, and you can get that from your manufacturer spec, um, and then deciding whether or not to amplify your antenna based on that cable loss is what this was intended for. There's some other advanced things you can do with antenna amplification, but the general idea is that you're going to measure your cable loss, and you're going to try to make up for that so that when you get back to your receiver or your distribution amplifier, you're at a zero loss sum. Best practice, okay? If anything, <laughs> uh, I, would, I would recommend um, attenuating versus amplifying. Remember that when you amplify your antennas, you're not amplifying the nine frequencies that you want to amplify. You're amplifying everything that antenna sees. So if it's a wideband antenna, it's 470 to 698, all the noise in that whole spectrum just went up 10 dB when you push that switch. It's not selective. It doesn't know which frequencies you want to amplify, okay? So your noise just raised. If you have analog systems, your signal to noise level just raised, right? Um, so often when you attenuate 6 dB on products, your noise floor goes down 4 or 5 dB, but your signal strength goes down 1 dB, right? So this is to do with physics and how things proper and like the amplitude at which your signal is received and the loss chart and how that is calculated. Um, but really, oftentimes you're better off attenuating. You're going to have better cylinder noise ratio than amplifying. Uh, so use amplifiers uh, cautiously would be my recommendation. Antenna questions, just on types, makes. So we're talking about uh, bandpass filtering, which is a, an inline device that you can place or some manufacturers make them built into their antennas. Uh, so we talked about how an amplifier is going to boost the entire spectrum of that antenna, right? 478, 698 in that example. What a bandpass filter does is pre-amplifier, it's going to suck down what that antenna has seen, put it through a processor or a, a, an analog filter, uh, and you're going to Sometimes you can tune those, or you buy them preset. So um, a, lot of, a lot of companies make 470 to 636, which is like what's available to us right now. You put that little thing in line between your two B and Cs, and now you're only looking at that. They can go down to one TV channel. They can go down to less than one TV channel if you want to get super, super critical in your filters. So those get pretty expensive, uh, but there is a way to filter your cable length pre-amplification so that you filtered what you want to see down to a certain bandwidth. Um, there, there is no product of which I am aware of that accurately, uh, independently filters based on carriers, right? Um, it's been talked about, but it doesn't exist yet, but you can filter, you know, 10 TV channels. So what that does is that takes all that noise that exists outer, out, out of those 10 TV channels and reduces it to a nominal level, and they all have different specs, um, but usually neg 110-ish, or depending on what the loss is. Uh, but yeah, if you can filter pre-amplification in YouTube, that's kind of an advanced tactic, but something to be aware of that does exist. Filter, amplification, antenna questions. Cool. So, now that we know about our antennas, we talked about orientation. Uh, I don't love this slide. I'm going to skip it. <laughs> um, avoid parallel surfaces. So, uh, anybody know what a quarter wave antenna is? So we talk about half wave antennas for the most part, which is pretty much what we see. Um, a quarter wave antenna is a, a very small antenna that takes a quarter of the wavelength, combines that with a ground plane, which is usually a piece of metal that's reflective, uh, and based off the reflective point and the quarter wave, you, you get basically what is a half wave information. Um, so those are designed uh, with a whole lot of math involved, and somebody much smarter than me designs them. 
Uh, what you do when you put an antenna next to another piece of metal or ground plane that isn't measured is you get destructive reflections, okay? Um, so a lot of people look at this and go, oh, well, a quarter wave antenna sits right next to a plane. It's designed to do that. It's been measured, the size of the metal and the reflectant has been measured to do that. If you've got a wall or a metal wall or your rack is in the corner and your antenna is right next to that wall, you're creating destructive interference from those reflections, okay? So I like to say, let your antennas breathe. Give them as much spatial awareness as you can. You're going to reduce close reflections and you're going to get better line of sight, okay? Uh, no antenna farms. Uh, antennas have a whole lot of metal down inside those rubber cores. Metal uh, is an interfering object to RF. So you've just created a little mini Faraday cage with a bunch of copper pipes right next to each other uh, and where you thought you were receiving a bunch of RF at, okay? This is where antenna distribution comes into play. If you've got a rack with eight receivers and you've got whips on all eight of them, you should be putting antennas at the top and then you can cascade out the back. Um, that's not the best practice either, but it's better than an antenna farm. Um, so avoid parallel surfaces. Transmitter to receiver antenna spacing. How far away should my antenna be from my hand mic or my body pack? Um, we say three meters or ten feet. Um, I like to say uh, I like to say about six wavelengths as minimum. You can have RF overload. Uh, so if you get really close to your antenna, your antenna's gained up. You're going to see a red light on your antenna and a red light on your receiver, right? And this is going to be an overload of information in the the internal receivers of your at your receiver. Um, can only take so much power input of RF level, right? Um, and so if you're above that power level, it's not going to be able to decode the information. So you can be too close. It's very rare, uh, but it is possible. Receiver antenna to receiver antenna spacing. So earlier I touched on what your wavelength distance is and what happens when you have multipath interference. So how far away should my two receive antennas be? Uh, minimum is one wavelength. Um, I like to say as far away as practical. So if you've got two pieces of 25 foot quality B and C sitting in your church, you should probably get your antennas 50 feet apart, right? As long as they're in a properly placed space, you're going to get different reflections. You're going to get different line of sight. You're going to give yourself the best odds of different information hitting your two antennas, right? You get to a point, if you've got 600 feet of cable, like, okay, don't go put 600 feet of cable in between your two antennas because now you have loss, right? But as far away as practical um, for your two receives, and this is the biggest one, in my opinion, um, which is how far away should a transmit antenna be from a receiving antenna? Again, as far away as practical. So we talked about who's running in-ear monitors, wireless in-ears. Okay, so you got a rack of in-ears, you've got an eight pack, you've got eight analog transmitters coming through a DA that's amplifying that value. They're at 50 milliwatts a piece and they all come out one transmit antenna. About 30 slides ago, we saw what happens when you put nine transmitters on a table right next to each other and the noise floor goes crazy. What do you think is coming out of a transmit antenna with eight 50 milliwatt transmitters that are all analog that you've combined into one antenna? If you put a scope right in front of that antenna, the noise floor is through the roof. It's crazy, okay? So if you've got your transmit antenna right here, if you receive antenna right here, this receive antenna is seeing that ridiculous amount of noise that you've created coming out of your transmit space, okay? So, uh, more importantly than your receive antennas, having minimum wavelength, one wavelength spacing is getting a transmit antenna as far away from a receive antenna as possible, as practical. Okay. Loss characteristics are the same. So if you've got a transmit combiner and you're shipping that out to an antenna, you do want to be um, aware of how much cable is in line there and what your loss is. But more often than not, I've got a phone call that says, hey, my RF receive lights are all on overload. And I have no idea why. All my mics are off and, you know, I don't know what's going on. Turn your combiner off. I'll turn their combiner off. Oh, it's all gone. Where's your transmit antenna? Two feet behind my receive antenna. All right, move that ten feet to the right. Turn it back on. Good to go. Uh, so be aware of what you're transmitting in all aspects. Whenever you turn a transmitter on, <laughs> uh, from a body pack to a hand mic to what's in a rack for an in-ear or an IFB, you're emitting energy out of an antenna, and that's affecting other things that are happening in your space. So be aware of that and make decisions based on what you've learned here today uh, to, to make that better, right? So keep your transmit away from your receive. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, height is your friend. 
essentially everything between your antenna and your receive antenna and your transmit antenna is destructive and causes interference. Um, so while this is really good placement for me right here, it's not bad, I love it, there's nothing in between it, you could also have put these on those rails with some height. The reason is that this room is elevated. So the space between this receive or this transmit antenna and that would still have perfect line of sight. If this were a flat room and those antennas are at the back of the room, you've got a bunch of chairs and a bunch of bodies between your receive antenna and your transmit antenna. Okay? Bodies are made up of water. Water doesn't go through RF all that well. Uh, so humans are, are quite uh, can cause quite a bit of interference. So if you've got some mic stands and you have to have your antennas at front of house, like Put them on some mic stands and get them way up top. Get them over people's heads. And now you've got what is a good line of sight from both the transmit coming up this way and the bounce off the ceiling, right? Anything off the floor is going to get sucked up by those bodies. So if you can get any type of height in your system, um, I would recommend it. Um, if I was ever doing uh, arena shows, pretty much anywhere I could, uh, we were flying antennas. So we'd go to the rafters and, and fly antennas down. So you'd have somebody on center stage, and there'd be an antenna eight feet above their head. And you'd never see it. Uh, but that's the closest we can get and the best line of sight. So that's not practical for a lot of you, but height is your best friend. Body attenuation, we just talked about this. This pack behind me, uh, the antenna is obviously between my body and the pack. If I turn this way, if you were to put this on a scope right now, and we were looking through this, this frequency, if I turn this way, you'd see about a 12 dB increase on average. If I turn this way, you're going to see that go down about 12 dB. Okay? So be aware of if you're using body packs on your head pasture or your band um, and where your antennas are. If they're in front of house and all their packs are behind their body, you've got 12 dB before you've even started on what's between your stage and where your front of house is. Right? Um, so be aware. In this instance, on body packs, this is really good placement back here. Right? It's behind my body. I've created a line of sight. It's not seeing this interference between my body and the belt pack. I'm all about backstage antennas for belt packs. Cool? Antenna symmetry. Basically, does my A antenna have to be the same as my B antenna? And the short answer is no. What is best for your application? Where can you put your two antennas and what makes the most sense based on what we know about pickup pattern? Uh, what does matter is trying to match the gain between both sides. So you don't want A to be plus 20 dB and B be negative 20 dB, right? Um, but you could have a helical and a dipole or two LPDAs or an LPDA and a, man a manufacturer's whip. If those are the decisions that you make and it works for your space, fantastic. There is no law that says they have to be the same. So best practices, place above audience, other obstructions. As close to transmitters as practical, don't overload the front end. Place away from other sources of interference, transmit antennas, LED walls, super noisy, cause all kinds of problems, keep your antennas away from them, um, and use your directionality appropriately. <coughs> Questions on antennas and placement, or anything we've covered so far, or not covered? Wisps? Yeah, spikes of, uh, yeah. Like yep, okay. Uh, is that possibly because of the antennas? Because there's a rack and it looks like, I guess, how you call it, a bar. <laughs> yeah. So, like, they're all. And where's the rack at? Side stage? It's, uh, in the back, like, behind on the stage. That, that is signal to noise happening. Uh, and so the noise is, is occasionally becoming louder than your signal carrier coming out of those antennas, or wherever that is on your stage. And the receiver pack is hearing the noise more than your intended transmit signal. And it's doing its best job to figure out whether it's supposed to be hearing that or not. And uh, so it fights it pretty well, and you hear it, and it gets rid of it again. Uh, but, yeah, it sounds like you, you would be better off getting an a antenna combiner and uh, breaking out those. How many do you have? Uh, I think there's eight. Or just, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Find a combiner, combine those, and break that antenna out to a helical or a transmit antenna that's singular with all those transmits coming out. 
and get some height on it and get it a little bit closer to your stage. The next question is where, where are those frequencies at in the spectrum, which we're going to talk about right now. Like, are they living in DTV? I don't know. You know, if they're 8 dB above the noise floor, you're only going to be able to go 12 feet. You know, so um, frequency coordination. Uh, where are your frequencies at in the spectrum uh, relevant to noise? Um, so is anybody doing scans and sweeps with the device to look at their spectrum in here? A small handful? Okay. Does anybody have a frequency analyzer? I guess you, that would be a yes. Okay. How many people have Sure products? Okay. Um, just for those of you that do uh, wireless workbench, you can do a scan with a Sure product. It's a free software. Start doing scans. So. Coordination. What is frequency coordination? The system designed coordinated frequencies for all wireless devices for the event in order to avoid outside interference and system-to-system -system interference. So this is where we look at intermods, thirds and fifths. We look at what the noise floor is of where you're going to operate, where should we be operating, and how do we determine that. Okay? So, the basics. Uh, number one, I have to say it, you can't reuse frequencies. Thank you. You have to use individual frequencies for all your devices. Okay? Uh, number two, consider your total wireless needs. What this point is really trying to say is that there are limitations to multiple types of gear that you can get. More often than not, what that means is that you've got a set of in-ears that are H4 band. What you want to find out is how many open TV channels do I have in H4? How many transmitters do I need to fit inside that H4 band? If I've got some mics that happen to cross over in that H4 band, but they can work in TV channel 14, I don't want to put my mics up where my H4 ears are, because now I don't have any room for my ears. So I'm going to put the mics down low, and I'm going to leave the space. So whatever your most limited piece of RF equipment is, based on bandwidth and based on what your scan is in your room, is what you want to coordinate first. Does that make sense? Because that's the most limited space and the hardest thing you're going to have. So if you have wideband gear, you're going to save that till the end. Or if you've got some gear that has nine open TV channels because you're really lucky and you've, the other pieces of gear only has one open TV channel, you're going to want to start with, with that piece of gear that only has one open TV channel and make sure you use that one open TV channel for that gear. Does that make sense? So that's what it means by consider total wireless needs. Like what's the big picture? Try to get a scan and start to visualize where that stuff works and why. Okay? And then coordinate the frequencies. So operating range, um, this is more for festivals and pro operation, but like, can I reuse frequencies between two stages? Can I use two frequencies, two of the same frequencies between, you know, my main chapel and the youth room that's X, how far away? Well, how far away are you transmitting? What's your output power? Can you see what you're transmitting in your original room at your second room? Yes or no? Do I need to reuse frequencies because I'm limited by bandwidth and I only have X amount of open space in my scan? So the easy way to do that is if you have the same receiver in both locations, tune them to the same channel, turn the mic on in one location, and go to the second location and look at the receiver. Am I seeing any of that noise? If you're not, you're probably safe to use the same frequency in both places if you have to, right? If you're limited by bandwidth and space. But what is your operating range? Cool. Propagation loss. This is the most difficult thing to measure on a system. This is the loss between my transmit antenna and that receive antenna through the space. It's changing all the time. It differentiates between multipath and distance. Um, so this is a chart to kind of show that, but it's probably one of the most difficult things to measure accurately. What you can measure is what your loss is once it hits your antenna and gets to your receiver. Cool. More noise means less range. We're going to hammer this point home find an empty or a, a you know a low level channel with no noise you're going to get a whole lot more distance uh, this, these are not exact numbers uh, but you know at neg 100 dB with that kind of signal to noise that's a representation of the signal to noise by the way right the noise is the gray how much space do I have between my top signal point and my noise really good signal to noise on the left I'm going to get 500 feet right that's not an accurate number but that's just this is just a graphic uh, a little bit more noise is going to diminish that quite rapidly and then a ton of noise, I'm not going to be able to go very far at all. So that could be what's happening to your in-ears. I don't know what the noise floor is, where your frequency is. But by moving that frequency to a place where there's less noise, you're going to significantly improve your range without moving any of your antennas or doing anything else. Okay? 
site survey. So this is what we, we use in broadcast or for a lot of other options, but you should do a site survey at your site. You have to find a way to get a scan so you know what your environment looks like. If not, you're just, you know, throwing darts with the blindfold on. So uh, figure out our device. There's uh, RF Explorer, which is like 400 bucks. It's this little handheld um, RF device that RF Venue makes, I think, that you can buy. There's a thing called a Nano VNA that's 60 bucks um, that you can buy on Amazon. These are all little frequency scanners, frequency analyzers that you can pick up. Um, if you have a Sure product and a computer, you can download Wild Frequency for free, and you can use that to scan. There's a whole lot of ways to get a scan. Um, do yourself a favor, scan your environment, take note of it. Also, it changes <laughs> often. Um, so do it, do it frequently, uh, make notes of your changes, and understand what your environment looks like. Uh, sources of interference, we talked a little bit about LED walls. Um, quick story, I was doing a, was doing a Kelly Clarkson Christmas special in Vegas, and we were through rehearsals, and we were like 45 minutes to air, just got back from catering, and the entire RF rack was lit up like a Christmas tree, and I had no idea why. The noise was through the roof, there were no mics on, nothing was going to work. So I get my scanner out, and I start walking with my antenna, and I get 10 feet away from my rack, and the noise is gone. And I turn around, and it's through the roof. So I turn all my, my receivers off in the rack, there's no change, there's still a ton of noise. Um, I ended up, I, I unplugged a piece of rope light that we had ran in the back of that rack as a way to light up this rack backstage in a dark space. That analog rope light had broken, a piece of it had started to arc, and I was causing RF noise on all of my receivers inside my own rack. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of stuff that can give you a lot of noise problems, right? If it's got electronics in it, it can em emit RF. Um, so be aware of that and try to hunt that down, cool? Uh, avoid active TV channels. It's pretty basic. A whole lot of noise. You don't want to operate in them if you don't have to. Uh -huh. Identify them with a scanner. Use a scanner. Um, noise floor during a scan. That's a clean noise floor. If you're going to want to know what that looks like on a, on a graph representation, there looks like one big carrier here on the right. A little bit of noise at the beginning, but overall it's like neg 100 dB. That's pretty good. Really noisy RF space. Not a lot of DTV, but a whole lot of transmits happening in there. This is what TV channels now look like. There's these big, giant blocks of 6 megahertz space, right? So that's a 6 megahertz white spot. Um, so you'd want to put your mics in those little sliver valleys if you had to. Um, from our standpoint, G is the bottom of the spectrum. So anything with a G, G50, G10, uh, ears is like 14 through 23. So you would have what looks like three open TV channels, the first one, that one, and that one. That's where you'd want to put your, your in-ears or your mics or in those valleys. If you put them in those big giant towers, you're going to go six feet and have no fun. Cool? Two-way radios, super high power, um, usually operate around 450. This is why you see most of the effect happening down below. If you have two-way two radios at your church or your venue, be aware that when you key that, um, usually they're set to a watt. It's crazy. You can turn those power down on that and cause less effects of interference. That's an LED wall with no image, so just operating but blank. Be aware that when those things fire up, the noise floor raises. This is not as common as it is with new, uh, newer LED models. They've figured out how to solve some of this, but if you have an LED wall that's a little bit older, it's quite possible that it's emitting a whole lot of RF. The inner mods, um, so how do you deal with intermons if you don't um, know how to do all the math? There's two ways. Uh, the first way is to use groups and channels. So if you have a manufacturer's device that's included groups and channels built in, you can go to group four and select channel one. That's going to be coordinated with group four, channel two, three, four, five, six. Those groups and channels are pre-coordinated from the manufacturer. A lot of them make them, right? However, if you're using multiple brands and types of RF. That coordination is now null and void. It was designed to work with that type of RF and that bandwidth only. Okay? So if you only have one type of RF in one bandwidth, you can use groups and channels. If not, you should find a software. So there's a bunch on the market that do intermodulation analysis for you. You punch in some numbers, it does the math, it tells you which ones are good. Okay? We make one, IAS from PWS makes one, 
um, you can type in intermodulation analysis software and figure out who does it. Cool. Seven frequencies can cause 42 intermodulation properties. So if you've got seven transmitters on a stage, you're looking at 42 intermods. So if you've got more than seven, you've got a whole lot of intermods. This is why you need to account for them. Cool? Um, can you see the red lines on there? Ish? Yeah, that's eight analog transmitters. All those red lines are um, the intermod properties that would exist if you were to put those in the spectrum. What's important to note about this is you notice those are all uh, A-band from, from a manufacturer, so they're within what is four TV channels, the actual transmitters, but the interference is wideband. The thirds and the fifths go exponentially out. So just because you have some analog transmitters in this space doesn't mean the intermods don't, don't push out of the spectrum. They do. Um, and so, so software accounts for that um, to do the math for you. Saw that. Boom. There's your drinking from a fire hose RF class. <laughs> uh, questions? What Sure products let you use wireless workbench? Um, all, of our, all of our products are in wireless workbench from a uh, coordination standpoint. So you can select them in the coordination tab, um, choose that product, and then put it into your coordination portion of that, and then hit calculate. Um, the top four or five tier products are what will connect to Workbench via the network, and you can automatically send from the software. So QLXD, ULXD, Axiom Digital, um, if you network those products into a switch and then plug that into your laptop, you can coordinate in Workbench, hit send, and it's going to coordinate your rack for you. It's going to send that information to your rack. Uh, but products below that, GLX, um, the old SLX stuff, uh, it's in, it's in the, the software, so you can select it and then import it and select how many channels you have of it and hit coordinate, but then you have to go manually punch those numbers in still. Anything else? Where did you say the slideshow was on the website? It's uh, Insure Audio Institute. Uh, so it's sure.com. You're going to go to resources, like the fifth tab down is Sure Audio Institute. And then it's our um, wireless master class. So you've got to make an account just so we, so we know who's accessing. We don't send you anything. It's not a contact point. We don't sell it or anything like that. Um, and then uh, you can find in the, the Sure RF master class files will be the, the PowerPoint that's 130 more slides than that one was. Yeah. Great. Last question. I'll Going be at once. the booth. Yeah. Going twice. Yes. So Jason will be here at the booth. Remember, uh, go by that EV booth and sign up for the drawing of that speaker system they're giving away. Because somebody's going to walk out of here with a, uh, okay. a very nice system. I'm signing up. Yep. <laughs> and you're disqualified. Uh, <laughs> uh, paid participants. Shucks. Sure. Um,